Hey everyone, so today we're going to be going over chapter 17, the markets for labor and other factors of production. This is our last chapter of this semester and we're going to go a little bit old school today with um, it being handwritten rather than on the iPad. So as far as what we're going to be covering, we're going to be talking about the demand for labor, the supply for labor, equilibrium within the labor market, and then explaining differences um, in wages kind of across the board. So first thing we wanna talk about is the fact that labor itself, it's one of our four factors of production that we've talked about in the past. Remember we had land, labor, what we're gonna be focusing on today, capital, and entrepreneurship. So labor markets themselves are important to understand because labor is, income is the most important source of income for most of us. And labor itself is the most important input for most firms. So when we think about the labor market itself, we want to think and remember that in the labor market, firms and businesses are the buyers, while workers are the sellers. So when thinking about this, does this make much of a difference? Can we explain why different workers are paid different amounts? That's what we're going to be talking about this chapter. So um, if we're looking and thinking about um, a company, let's say Apple, and if they want to hire more workers to make um, the new iPhone that just came out, um, essentially the reason they decide to hire more workers is not because they have a preference for hiring workers, it's because they're trying to maximize profits, right? And so we want to think about their demand for workers is a derived demand. So kind of like the demand for other factors of production, um, derived demand um, depends on the demand for the good, the factor produces. So we're talking about the factor as far as land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. So in Apple's case, the demand for workers, it depends on how many more iPhones they're able to produce if it hires an additional worker and also the additional revenue that they're going to be receiving from selling the additional iPhones. Okay, so um, we also want to think about just what I touched on is, again, if we're assuming um, that Apple is a price taker, they're going to want to consider, um, you know, how much each worker is costing them relative to how much each worker is producing. So we kind of touched, I believe, on this in the past, but the idea of, let me scoot that up really quick, the idea we have a marginal product of labor. The marginal product of labor, um, it is the additional output a firm produces as a result of hiring one more worker. So remember, marginal is that extra amount, and it's marginal product of labor. So product, that's the output of labor. So the additional output a firm produces from hiring one more worker. Ultimately, we're going to care as the firm who's hiring about the money it's going to receive. So it's going to calculate the change in revenue from hiring an additional worker as well. That is what's called the marginal revenue product of labor, which is the change in revenue from hiring an additional worker. 
So here, the two ideas we want to think about, marginal product is the actual output, while marginal revenue is the revenue from hiring um, an additional worker. So when we're thinking about marginal revenue product of labor, um, in terms of a formula, we can calculate MRP is equal to your price times your marginal product. So how much it's costing you, or actually not how much it's costing you, but how much you're selling your product for times um, how, many, how much output you're producing. So now let's think about essentially um, the relationship between our marginal revenue product and the wage. So we can think about the wage as the actual cost um, each additional worker is incurring for the company. So if marginal revenue product MRP is greater than your wage, you're going to, going to want to, um, as a company, Hire more workers to increase profit. If your marginal revenue product is less than your wage, you're going to want to hire less workers to increase your profit. Then finally, if your MRP is equal to your wage, the firm is actually hiring the optimal number of workers and maximizing profit. So we can think about this in terms of what our profit maxim maximization um, condition is, which is MR, marginal revenue, equals what marginal cost. And so what we can do is we can remember that our marginal cost for hiring an additional worker, that's our, our wage, actually. So our marginal cost is the wage we're having to pay the additional workers and so we want our wage to equal our marginal revenue product in order to maximize profits okay let's go to the next page so now um we're gonna kind of recover some things that we talked about in chapter three about you know, what shifts a market demand um, and what shifts market supply, but specifically focusing on, on labor. So um, when it comes to factors that shift the market demand curve, we want to talk about increases in human capital, changes in technology, changes in the price of a product, changes in quantity of other inputs, and changes in the number of firms in the market. So keep in mind, um, increases in human capital, I just defined it for you there. Um, human capital is the accumulated knowledge and skills that workers acquire from formal training or, and education or from life experiences. So what you're doing right now watching this video, um, essentially better workers produce more, which is going to increase their MRP and increase the demand for workers. So if we have an increase in human capital, we're going to see um, a right shift of demand for labor. So D subscript L stands for the labor demand curve. As far as changes in technology go, think about improvements in technology are allowing workers to be more productive, which shifts the labor demand curve again to the right. So as tech improves workers, become more productive. So labor demand shifts right. Also vice versa, if technology um, 
actually doesn't improve, workers are becoming going to become less productive, so labor demand is going to shift left. As far as changes in the price of the prices of the product, um, a higher price is going to increase MRP, which shifts labor demand right. A lower price um, decreases MRP, which shifts it left. Shifts right, lower price reduces MRP, so labor demand shifts left. Okay. Changes in the quantity of other inputs. So if other inputs, um, you know, change or increase, if there's an increase in um, more machinery or other inputs, um, it's going to tend to lead to, an un again, an increase in the productivity of workers, increasing the demand of labor. Causes increase in productivity So the labor demand curve shifts right. And then our last one is changes in the number of firms in the market. So think about if there's an increase in number of firms, um, they're going to want to hire more people. So demand's going to shift right. If there's a decrease in the number of firms, um, there won't be that as many hiring. So demand is going to shift left. Causes demand of labor to shift left. Y'all can't see that. Okay. So now that we talked about um, labor demand, we're going to talk about labor supply really quick. So when we think about the labor supply, it's actually referring to um, decisions of individuals. about how much to work. So essentially labor economists are going to look at and assume that we as individuals divide our time between either working or not working. So between labor and leisure. So what would happen if you increased your hourly wage, how would that affect how much you actually want to work? So what that what that assumption looks like is, um, let me just show this here. As um, wage rates increase, so this is going to be wage, and this is going to be Q of labor, quantity of labor. As the wage rate increases, leisure becomes expensive relative to consumption. So individuals are going to um, consume less leisure and work more. So it's going to be an upward sloping labor supply curve. So I'll just make a note here. As wages increase, the leisure is more expensive, so consume more, actually less leisure and more work. an ugly star okay however 
if the wages get really, really high, it actually might cause an individual to work less instead of more. So an example of this is um, like if a musician um, can make 500 or five thousand dollars per concert she may perform only 50 concerts a year but let's say let's add another zero to that let's say she can actually make fifty thousand dollars per concert now then she may choose to perform fewer concerts so in this case we want to think about the labor supply curve can also be backward bending in the sense that you hit a point in which even if they're paying you more, you might actually um, produce less. Last page. So now we're gonna look at, again, the factors that shift the labor supply curve. We have changes in population, changes in demographics, and changes in alternatives. So as far as changes in population themselves, um, if you have an increase in population, this can be from immigration or um, higher um, birth rates, um, lower death rates, right? Um, if there's an increase in the population, um, supply of labor will shift, right? If there's a decrease in the population, supply of labor shifts left. So we want to think about um, historically, um, for example, this is kind of relevant to what's going on right now, but the Black Plague, it killed off a significant amount of the working population, um, which was very detrimental to um, the global European economy specifically. So we can kind of think of that as an example. Another thing would be changing demographics. Essentially, um, as people age and they retire, so they're going to leave the workforce. So we can think about as people age, they retire and leave the workforce. which shifts shifting the labor supply curve to the left. Another kind of example of this was comparing um, the role of women in the workforce as well. Um, in 1900, there was only about 21% of women were in the labor force in the U.S., but today um, the figure is kind of closer to 50%, actually. I think it might be a little bit higher, 60%. Um, and so thinking about that change um, in, in culture as well changes the demographics and will shift the labor supply curve. Changing alternatives is our final one. So essentially, um, people have alternatives to work. Um, a change in how attractive um, uh, the alternatives are changes the labor supply curve. So if we think about um, if the wage rate changes in an alternative job, um, then you might decide to um, move to a, um, work in a different industry or maybe if um, unemployment benefits um, increase, uh, it may be actually, uh, you know, act better to stay unemployed. So let's think about um, just wage rates and then unemployment benefits. Last section, our last section is over um, explaining, um, well, I guess we're not really going to talk about um, equilibrium in the labor market too much. I move, was moving too quickly, I guess. Um, as far as, we're two more sections to go. As far as equilibrium in the labor market, we're just going to want to think about where the demand curve and the supply curve intersect. So we got, again, wage and then quantity of labor, 
have our supply of labor, and then we're going to have our demand of labor. So equilibrium is going to be where they intersect, and that's going to be um, uh, where the equilibrium wage and quantity is going to be. Okay, now on to our last section. We're not going to get too much into... Um, you know, the effects because y'all have done quite a bit on shifting the supply and demand curve already. So you should understand based on the factors that we talked about, um, what that does to, um, you should be able to read a graph and sh um, understand what that does related to the wage rate and the quantity of labor if supply changes or if demand changes. As far as our last section, we're gonna explain some differences in um, in wages, really, if uh, we're flying through this chapter because you could spend a whole semester just going over um, the labor market. Actually, there is a whole separate class called labor economics that um, Dr. Terry teaches about all of this going into a lot of different detail and explaining um, differences in wages specifically. And so we're just going to briefly kind of go over it. But one one thing that might explain differences in wages would be a compensating differential. So that is a a higher wage that compensates workers for unpleasant aspects of a job. An example of this could be like hazard pay. So with um, compensating differentials, um, think about they're trying to um, factor in the risk involved in actually performing the job. So in this case, think about all of the nurses and doctors that are having to be exposed to COVID-19 on a day-to-day -day basis. Potentially, um, they may be paid a, a hazard pay or a compensating differential, potentially. Um, obviously, hospitals sometimes can't do that, but um, employees generally like if the if a job is dangerous or unpleasant, they're generally going to have to pay a premium um, on that. Um, as far as um, you know, economic discrimination. Thinking about um, if you pay somebody a lower wage and exclude or exclude a person from an occupation based on irre irrelevant characteristics like race or gender. Typically, that is um, illegal. It would violate the Equal Pay Act and the Civil Rights Act. So we want to think about um, potentially that that still could um, could occur. And so it's paying a lower wage or lower pay or excluding on the basis of irrelevant characteristics such as race or gender. It's illegal. Finally, the last um, thing we want to think about also is that there's other things that can explain wage differentials. One being differences in education, two differences in experience, and three differing preferences for jobs. So um, typically, um, you know, wealthier individuals have um, higher average education than poor individuals. Um, and so that could be um, an explanation for a wage differential. Another thing, again, differences in experience. So um, women tend to spend more time out of the labor force than men um, due to um, parenting roles. And so um, sometimes women will have less job experience than men of the same age. 
Finally, different differing preferences for jobs essentially men and women tend to actually select different jobs for themselves um, this may be due to discrimination but it also just may be due may be due to preferences um, you know some people may just prefer more flexible hours um, versus versus others so just kind of some ideas that ex examples that explain um, wage differentials so really, um, that kind of covers this chapter um, fairly quickly. I know that was fast and furious, but hopefully um, that explains chapter um, 17. And if you have further questions, comments, or concerns, just please feel free to let me know.